opportunities to come into his house and to lift up his most holy and righteous name. I'm reminded of the uh, words of the late Dr. T.M. Chambers who used to say uh, that there are too many cold storage Christians in this world. And he said there are too many cold storage churches. He said that, 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 that he was not uh, an advocate for fanaticism. He said he would much rather be uh, God's, God's fire than to be the devil's icicle. Mm -hmm. He says because worship in scripture should never be cold, dull, and dry. Mm -hmm. The Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord, mm -hmm. all ye lands. The Bible says clap your hands, O ye nations. There's all of this stuff in the Bible. What do you think that is there for? It's to influence and to encourage the congregation and to show us how we should be lifting up his name each week. Amen? Amen. And, 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 and I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, too ashamed to say that in every church there ought to be some amen, some hallelujah, some thank you, Jesus, uh, some clapping hands, some nodding of the head, some stomping of the feet. All of that is an expression of adoration and praise and worship to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Amen. We thank God for it this morning. If you have your Bibles, could you turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 13? Please do pray with me as I study the book of Ezekiel. I studied 12 chapters this week and outlined all 12 and just tried to figure out what to preach from those 12 chapters. And so I want to slow down that I have been covering three chapters and four chapters at once. And today we just want to look at chapter 13. Amen. Verses 1 through 9. Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. You have it, say amen. Amen. Ezekiel chapter 13. Before I do that, let me, let me open up a word of prayer. Gracious Lord our God, we thank you, Father, for this opportunity to stand and to preach your word. And we pray, God, that you would uh, empower me, give me all that is needed to accomplish the task, but also to help your people, help us to be receptive to all that you will show us in your word today. We pray that you would always, by your spirit, guard our hearts from all error, that we may continue, Lord, as your people to walk in your word, walk in your truth, and live lives that are glorifying to you. We ask this in Jesus' name and for sake I pray. Amen. Amen. I begin reading at verse 1. And, and the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy and say thou unto, and say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. O Israel, thy prophets are like the foxes in the desert. Ye have not gone up into the gaps, neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel to stand in the, in the battle in the day of the Lord. They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. Have ye not seen a vision, a vain vision? Have ye not spoken a lying divination? Whereas ye say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. Amen. Amen. Again, looking at that eighth verse, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. I want to talk this morning about the danger of false prophets among God's people. 
the danger of false prophets among God's people. You may be seated in the presence of God. When you have the time and you take the time, read Ezekiel chapter 12 through 24. My intent as much as I can is to walk us through these chapters, but the general theme of these chapters concerns God's covenantal judgment on a disobedient nation. God is loving and God is merciful and God always, from Genesis 3 verse 15, has sought to find ways to keep his promise to his people without violating his holy justice. Israel in Exodus, verse, in Exodus 19 has entered into a legal covenant with the Lord, promising him that in order to maintain his blessing, his temporal mercies in the land of Canaan, that they would keep his laws, meaning that they would give him a measure of religious fidelity, that they would not worship and serve other gods, and they have done the exact opposite. They've gone whoring after other gods. They have violated the covenant relationship with God Jehovah. They have committed adultery. And finally, God has had enough. God has borne more than he could bear. And he could not could tolerate their sin any longer. The Bible says that God would cast off his people, he would give them over to punishment, sending them into exile in Babylon. Now, in that day there were two messengers in, in Israel's day. On the one hand, there were true prophets of God and there were also false prophets of God. What was a true prophet and what was their responsibility? The true prophet's responsibility was to pass on the message that God had given them. Amen, somebody. Amen. A true prophet's responsibility is to be a faithful steward over the mysteries of God. That whatever God reveals to you, you don't, you don't tackle with it, you don't mess with it, you simply pass it on. And if, the, fact, and if the, 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 uh, the, the prophet is faithful in doing that, they are spared from any penalty and liability that can come upon them because they have done exactly what God has told them to do. They have simply declared the message. They are, they are God's messengers. They are his mouthpiece. Their job is simply to declare his message. The true prophets were rugged individualists. They, they were not primarily concerned about people's positions and their power, their job was to file suit against the nation of Israel when they went astray and warned them of the coming punishment that God would send. But also among the nation of Israel, there were not just true prophets in this text, there were also false prophets. <laughs> and the false prophets would do the exact opposite. They would unite in their cause against the truth. They would subvert the truth of God. They would overthrow the counsel of, 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 of God through his true prophet. The prophet of Jer Jeremiah had prophesied and predicted that God, for Israel's breach of covenant, would carry the nation away by a foreign power. And that power was Babylon. And the false prophets who were employed by the nation, who were employed by the state, came bringing a different message. They came declaring that would not happen. It's all peace. All is peaceful. There will be no war in Jerusalem. And here's what I want you to see today, this morning, and this is very important. And put this in your notes. Because the message that, we, that God shows us in chapter 13 of Ezekiel is that God's judgment is hard on the heels of false prophets. And their downfall is certain. That his judgment is hard on the heels of these false prophets and their downfall is certain. 
Beloved, listen, I don't care wherever you see false prophecy, wherever you see errors in the world, wherever you see lies, the person who is communicating those lies, at some point, their downfall is certain. God will judge them for that. Amen. And God judges the false prophets who are among the people of God in Israel's day. And I want to look at three things this morning as we consider this subject. First, I want to look at God pronouncing judgment on the prophets of Israel. And then secondly, I want to look at the advice of the false prophets. We'll note specifically how it turns to, to foolishness. And then thirdly, we'll look at false women prophets. Those three things. One, God pronouncing judgment on the prophets of Israel. The advice of false prophets turns to foolishness. And then false Women prophets. Amen. Amen. Israel is in exile. They've been banished. And yet there still remains in Jerusalem a remnant of people left who were not deported when Nebuchadnezzar invaded Israel for the first time. He took many of the nobles. He took young boys. He took Ezekiel and a few of, of, of the nobles who served in the royal court, but he left the greater portion of the nation behind, and they're still there. And these prophets are prophesying, telling, telling the nation that God would not send judgment. And we pick up that in verse number one. Look at verse number one. Amen. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy... And say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. I want you to note here first carefully the origin of their prophecy. Amen. The origin of their prophecy. Look at verse 2. They prophesy out of their own hearts. Verse 3 says, they follow their own spirit. Amen. In spite of claiming to be agents of the word of God, the, the very mouthpiece of God, these, these men were not communicating God's thoughts, God's, God's ideas. They were communicating their own ideas. That's what makes them a false prophet. They claim to be a mouthpiece of God, and yet instead of communicating his ideas to God's people, they're communicating their own ideas. The origin and the source of their word comes from them. Amen, somebody. Amen. Now here's what I want you to see. Now, I know that this is terrible, because I think that this is what, what's in this text. That these men believe that their opinion is as valid as God's opinion. Amen, somebody. That they believe instead of giving God's word that, that it's okay to give their own word because their words are as valid as God's word. Beloved, I don't care how great and how smart you think you are, your word is never as valid as God's word. Your words are always full of fallibility and failure, but God's words are always true. Let God be true and let every man be a liar. See, our opinions are not as valid as God's opinion. I heard all the time we, 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 hear, we hear people say things like, I know the word of God says that, but. Right. And the but to me means that my opinion is as valid as God's opinion. Amen, somebody. Amen. See, one of the fairies that we have as fallen creatures is that we follow and often we trust in our own reason. We enthrone our own reason. We think we're smarter than God. You cannot be smarter than God, and you cannot revise his word. God knows what's best for you, doesn't he? Yes. Doesn't God know what's best for you? Yes. We, we're called to trust in God's thoughts, trust in his will over our lives, and not follow our own will. Not just that. Look at verse number five, if you will. It says, ye have not gone up into the gas, neither have neither made up the hedge for the house of Israel, to stand in the day and, and stand in the battle in the day of the Lord. Note that. Where have these 
false prophets, where have they fallen short in their role and function? Verse 5 lets us know they had, failed, they had fallen short because they did not prepare God's people to properly respond to his works and to his providences that he would bring upon them. And by, by providence, I mean this, that God was about to chasten the nation of Israel. And the proper response to that was that they were to take their lips like a man. Amen, somebody. It was a hard truth. It was a hard message. But the right response to whatever God brings upon us is that we are to bear those things patiently. We are to submit to those things willingly and cheerfully. Why? Because God always knows what's best for you, doesn't he? And all the time God says to us, uh, it brings things upon our lives. He brings suffering, he brings hardship, and those hardships are, are easily go through, but they're the right thing. We're called to submit patiently to God's will. Amen. Amen. Because God didn't put you in a hard place. Amen. Amen, somebody. Now, again, as a pastor, I don't want to minimize hard places. Because on, on, on the human side, they're hard to deal with. But as God's creature living in God's world, we have to always trust God's wisdom. And when things happen in our life, they don't happen by accident. They happen by God's divine providence. Amen, somebody. Amen. And God just doesn't just send in our life prosperity. He also sends in our life sometimes, he sends adversity. Amen. Sometimes you lose jobs. You lose friends. Sometimes you lose health. Those are difficult and hard problems to treat to deal with, but God always sends those things in your life for a good purpose. That God was sending these hard and difficult providences in the life of Israel for a good purpose. But instead of, instead of submitting that, Israel tries to find a way to avert that. They have hired prophets who come and tell them the opposite of what the prophet of Jeremiah has already told them. You're going to be punished. That you're going to have 70 years of captivity to make up for 70 years in which you defile the Sabbaths. By worshiping not the true God, but by worshiping the false God, God's going to give them a time out. I don't know about you. Every now and then, God has to put us on time out. And I believe this last year in, in America, the church was put on time out. And then somebody. So that we can properly appreciate the things that we have. Amen, somebody. Prior to that, we were just going through the motions of church. But now we really appreciate the value of God's ordinance. We appreciate being in worship under it because we understand what it's like to not have those things. God knows how to put you on time out. He says, Israel is put on time out. That these prophets did not go up to, 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 to the wall of Israel. The prophet Ezekiel said that they, that they, they didn't fix the cracks in the wall. Judgment was coming and the, and the prophet's job was to prepare the people to respond to that providence and to those workings in faith. And I don't know what you're challenged by. But the real question is, are you worshiping God in the midst of it? Amen, somebody. And by worshiping God, I mean this, that you're finding joy in the midst of, in the, midst of the hardship. James 1 says, count it all joy when you go through what? Various trials. That you, the, the response of the Christian in the face of trials and afflictions, hardships and difficulties, is to be one of pure joy. We ought to count it joy because we know that God has some good and high and holy purpose in what he's putting us through. Yes. Now why did they do it? Why had these false prophets <laughs> given the false message? Amen. I want to give, I want to submit to you two reasons why they, they gave a false message. One is this. They want to maintain a fair external appearance. I'm going to put it another way. 
They want to be light. Amen, somebody. <laughs> and let me say this, too many men of God and too many pastors and too many preachers have one object. They want to be light. And when you want to be light, you can't always communicate the things of God. But guess what? When you communicate God's will to God's people, you ain't going to always be light. In fact, Christ said that people are not going to applaud you. They're going to hate you. There was once an interview by Billy Graham. Billy Graham was noted as one of the greatest evangelists who, who, who graced the American shores. Amen. And his crusades would pack out in stadiums in the thousands. And they were, he was once interviewed by Time Magazine. The question was asked, how does it feel to be the most popular man in the world? And Billy Graham responded by saying, I must be doing something wrong. And the interviewer was shocked. He said, what do you mean doing something wrong? Isn't it the aspiration of every preacher to be known as one of the most, the, one of the most popular people in America? Isn't, isn't that a great thing? He said, no, I, I must be doing something wrong because the Bible says when you love God, this world will hate you. The Bible says when you follow Christ, this world will despise you. Christ himself has said, I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring the sword. And there's somebody. And a man's enemies will be of his own household. When you stand for God, and when you speak for God, and when you share his word, people are going to hate you for it. Because people not only despise the truth, sometimes they despise the truth teller. Amen. Amen, somebody. If you got a problem with me, please write a letter to the, to the editor. <laughs> I'm just a messenger. I'm just telling it like it is. That, that, but often, when, when, when men stand and declare God's word, they're hated and they're despised for But these false prophets wanted to be light. Yeah. Not just a desire to be light, which was a fear of man. They also had a desire to maintain their own livelihood. Look at verse number 16, if you will. I'm sorry, verse 19. Are you there? Yeah. Look at what, listen to what God says. And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread? You see that? <laughs> see, that, that, that's what made false prophets. False prophets executed their trade for their own livelihood. Amen, somebody. A true prophet was a rugged individualist who depended upon God to take care of him, like the prophet Elijah did. When Elijah spoke for God and he was, he, was, he was exiled from Jerusalem and pushed out by, by, by Ahab and Jezebel, the Bible says that God still took care of him, that God fed him by the brook by, through a raven, that God dropped off his food. And guess what? When you are a faithful servant of God, God will always take care of you. I know he will. I, 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 I'm a witness to that. Yeah. I don't depend on you to take care of me. I depend on God. God is my sword. God is my God. God knows how to take care of me. Yeah. And there's somebody. I've been watching God taking care, take, take care of me before my church had a budget. Yeah. <laughs> before the offerings were what they are today, I watched God take care of me when I didn't know how my bills was going to get, get paid. I watched God make a way for me. Amen. 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 Because if, if, listen here, God will never give a vision without making the provision. He will supply. He will take care of his faithful servant. He will make sure that his faithful servant eats so that he does not have to depend on the people for his sustenance. And he can faithfully stand up every week and declare like what thus said the Lord. Amen. That's exactly what the Ezekiel did and what these false prophets did not do. Amen, somebody. Amen. Because they were concerned, one, to have the people's affection, but also concerned to have the people's gifts for support. Amen. Now, here's what I want you to know. Here's the key thing I want you to jot down. And that is this. A true messenger of God must stand up in the face of God's people 
and speak his word in his name and for his glory. Yeah. Amen. A true messenger of God must stand up in the face of God's people and speak his word in his name and for his glory. When you try to capitulate to people's requests and desires, you don't do them any service or God. Amen. Because if you are a, a pleaser of men, the Bible says you cannot be the servant of God. If you're here only to please people, you will never be a person who can please the Lord. But if you please God and nobody else is pleased, all praise be to his name. Because he's the one. I said he's the one. Well, you've been put here to please. Amen, somebody. Amen. See, if we compromise the truth in the church, however successful we may appear to be, we've done, we haven't done God a service. Neither have we done his people a service. Because God calls us as a church to boldly stand upon his word. That's, this is exactly what the false prophets of Israel did not do. They refused to stand up and boldly proclaim God's word of warning and judgment. Instead, they became a message of peace and prosperity. Here's what I want you to see this also. By doing that, they said in essence that God's word is not determinative. Amen. That what, that what, that what God says is going to happen, it may or may not actually happen. <laughs> Your life 
by the word of God. Yeah. Do you know that when you read the Bible, that this is, that this is Christ's instrument of ruling you, of his lordship? Yeah. Luke 6 and 46 says, says this, Christ said, why do you call me Lord and you do not the things that I say? See, when you read the Bible and you see things, hey, you know what, hey, wait a minute. That's not, not how, how I think. Then you should change how you think and think how God thinks. Amen, somebody. Yeah. We're not here to critique the Bible. The Bible is here to critique us. Yeah. Amen, somebody. Yeah. The Bible is here to critique your thinking, to critique, critique your living, to critique, critique your feelings and your emotions. The Bible has a critique for all of those things. And when your feelings and when your actions and when your attitudes run contrary to it, something has to give. And it's not the scriptures. Your attitudes, your actions have to be brought in conformity to what the Bible says. Amen, somebody. You know, you, you can't even call yourself a true disciple of Christ if you're not willing to do that. Christ himself has said that my sheep do what? They hear my voice and they follow me. Well, how does Christ speak? Mystically? No. He speaks to us through his word. Amen. How many of you have been walking with Christ this week? Amen. Raise your hand. You've been walking, you've been walking with Christ this week. You've been listening to him every single day out of his word. He wants to speak to you every day, not just on Sunday. <laughs> this is your general feeding. But the, the regular feeding should take place in your life every day. Amen. Your body needs food every day. Your soul needs food every day, too. Amen. Not just that. Not just preach the complete message of the scripture. Not just read the Bible with self-denial. I think it has also to this great importance. That, that these false prophets really point us to our, the one true prophet. Amen. Amen. Albeit they misrepresent Christ in their, in, 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 in their form, and they, they, they prefigure him, but they misrepresent him because Christ is the one true prophet to God's people who communicates to us God's complete will for our salvation and for our edification. Yeah. We have in Christ everything that we need to be saved and to be built up and are not to be confident in our faith. We have everything in Christ. Yeah. 2 Peter 1 says that God has given to us in Christ everything that pertains to life and for godliness through what? A knowledge of him. Amen. Colossians chapter 2 verse 3 says that in Christ Jesus are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And then it says that you are complete. How? You are complete through him and in him. Amen, somebody. Amen. That we have a prophet who has fed us. Every week we Christ feeds us. It's not the preacher who's feeding you. Whenever the word of God is being faithfully being ministered to his people, it's Christ being the one who's feeding you. He's the prophet to his church. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. I don't need no other, no, no new prophet. I don't need new revelation. I need Christ to, to speak to my heart through his revelation he's given every week. Amen. Not just God pronouncing a judgment on the prophets of Israel. Secondly, we look at the advice of false prophets. Turn to foolishness. Look at verse number 10. You have to say amen. Because even, because even because they have seduced my people, saying peace, and there was no peace. And one built up a wall, <laughs> and lo, others dogged it with untempered mortar. Say unto them which dog it with untempered mortar that it shall fall. There shall be an overflowing shower, and yea, ye, O great hell, a hailstone shall fall, and a stormy wind shall rend it. Lo, when the wall is fallen, shall it not be said unto you, Where is the dobbing wherewith ye have daubed it? Therefore, thus said the Lord God, I will even rend it with a stormy wind, and, and, and in my fury. And there shall be an overflowing shower in my anger and a great hailstone in my fury to consume it. So will I break down the wall that ye have dogged with untempered mortar and bring it down to the ground so that the foundation thereof shall be discovered and it shall, and it shall fall and ye shall be consumed in the midst thereof and ye shall know that I am the Lord. 
That's why I accomplished my wrath upon the wall and upon them that have daubed it with untempered mortar and will say unto you, the wall is no more, neither they that daubed it. Amen. What's happening in this verse? God is describing to us and showing us how the advice of these false prophets is turned to foolishness. And he does it by illustration. He says that one Israel has a weak wall, and instead of fixing the wall, what these men do is take untempered mortar, they take whitewash paint and just paint over it. As if to say, well, if it's painted, if it looks nice, it's not, nothing's wrong with it. It's okay, it's fine. What, but, but judgment proves it's not okay. The wall of Israel was not sturdy. When, when, when Babylon would come, the wall would fall. These, these people would have, the people would have trusted in these messengers to give them God's word, and they would have given them a false message, ensuring them of their own security. And when judgment came, the message that they had declared would be proven to be superficial, shallow, and a lie. And there's somebody. And let me say this, and he put this in your notes. The counsel of false prophets always fails. It always fails. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen guys on television say, my sister, you coming out this year. It's going to be, and guess what, that year is the same as last year. Amen, somebody. It never, even where it seems to have, in some way, have had, you would have had some success, ultimately, it always falls short. Why? Because they are not the voice of God. They are not true prophets. They're, they're claiming to speak for God, and God says, I have not sent them. They're claiming to have seen visions and have seen things from God that God did not give them. Amen, somebody. I don't, uh, I, I, I don't outright, as a man of God, condemn all secular counsel. Amen, somebody. I think that there are, that there are beneficial and profitable things that you can get even from, from, the, from, from the secular world because people who are secular are still in the image of God. Amen, somebody. That God's image has not been totally obliterated upon fallen men. They, they, they still have moral and reasoning capacity. Christ said, like, said like this, he said that sometimes the children of this world are wiser than the children of light. Amen. That there are certain matters the world gets it right and the church does not. Amen, somebody. Amen. When it comes to practical things, a lot of the practical things, they have a lot of wisdom to offer. But this is where the church, where, where I part with them. In spite of all of their observations, and research and studies. Amen, somebody. Amen. They still miss the basic, they, they don't operate from the basic premise of the sovereignty of God and the depravity of man. Amen. And therefore, whatever counsel they give you is going to always fall short. It's going to always be unsuccessful. Because men must always factor in the fact that God is in control of their, of their life and they are depraved. They are not. Amen, somebody. How many of you know that God is sovereign? Amen. Amen. How many know God is in control? Amen. Do you know how life, how hard it is to try to put life together without the sovereignty of God? I was once uh, asked uh, at a conference. I was they were, they were asking me all these questions with being floored and. One of the questions was, it was asking me, why do, you, why, do you, Pastor, why do you think black people have a difficulty processing slavery in America? Why, why is it difficult to process? It meant somebody. And my response to that was, because we don't see all things within the framework of God's sovereignty. Amen. Was slavery an atrocity? It certainly was. It's an atrocity that, they, that people who did it were held responsible for. But did God control it? Absolutely he did. Yeah. Amen, somebody. He did it with Israel. He put them in Egypt in bondage for 400 years. And when he got ready, he brought them out. Amen, somebody. He put us in America in bondage. And when he got ready, he brought us out. Amen. And we understand that, that, that those things are evil, but none of us, those things are things that God sovereignly controls. How, 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 how was Joseph able to process the 
wrongs his brother did, 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 did to him. His brothers had sold him into slavery. Amen. And then when he gets into slavery, he gets falsely accused by Potiphar's wife of rape. He gets thrown in prison for 15 years. 30 years later, his brother, he meets his brothers again in a family. And the Bible says he does not hold a single grudge against them. Why? Because in, in, in Genesis 15, he says this. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That, I know what you did, but there was a sovereign God controlling and overruling everything you did for his glory and for his purpose. And guess what? Slavery is an atrocity, but God overruled it for his glory and for his purpose. I think it was Phyllis Wheatley who said, "'Twas God that brought me from my pagan land, taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God and a Savior too, once I neither sought nor knew." You see that? Here's this woman coming out of slavery when she sees slavery within the framework of God's sovereignty, that God had a purpose in it, and that purpose was this, to introduce me to Jesus yeah. and to save my soul. And, we, and one day we're going to be able to look back on the pains and the hardships of this world and see these pains, these evils within the life of God's providence and know that God has always dealt with us lovingly, even when we can't see it. Yeah. Not just seeing things in the sovereignty of God. Do you, you know how hard it is to count somebody out the depravity of man? It's impossible. Because you can't help them with their pro help them solve their problem if you're unwilling to deal with the source of their problem. That's humanism, isn't it? Yeah. Humanism says, let me give people some money, and that's gonna fix the problem. No, it won't. You're giving money to people who, who are sinful. <laughs> Next somebody. What do people simple, 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 simple people do with money? They squander it. They misappropriate it. They don't put it to good use. Hey, Amen, somebody. I ain't talking about the sinners in the world. I'm talking about myself. I get funny. I don't always use it right. I buy cupcakes and sweets. I'm listening to Hey, man, money, money's not, not, not the answer. Is it? So we think about Give them money. Money solves everything. No, it doesn't. Money don't give you good sense, does it? Money doesn't does not give you good fiscal and uh, fiducial uh, practices, does it? No. See, we have to understand that, 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 that the, the, the counsel of the world is great, but the gospel and the wisdom of the gospel explodes every single human pretension. Amen. All of the pretensions of man's wisdom, the gospel explodes that stuff. Why? Because 1 Corinthians says, says like, that, like, like, like this. He says, to the wise of this world, to the scholars, those who think they know, that for all their knowledge, they didn't know Jesus. Amen, Amen somebody. You can have all the wisdom of the world and not have true wisdom and not have the wisdom that, that will save your soul. You don't know Jesus. Amen, somebody. That explodes all the pretensions of this world. That, that the world makes it smart, it makes it intellectual, but you ain't so smart. The only way that you're smart, beloved, is if God shines a light in your soul and reveals to you the sufficiency of Christ for your faith, the sufficiency of Christ for your justification, for your sanctification and growth, and for your obedience and perseverance and faith to the end. He is everything. And you don't have true wisdom until you can see all of life through that lens. That in Christ Jesus, I have everything. I may mean like ever, I may mean, I mean, I mean like riches, I may like, oh Lord. I may mean like health. But if I have him, I have everything I need. If I have him, in spite of how things appear for me in this world, I'm still saved and on my way to heaven. Say whatever, say whatever you, want, ever you want to say about me and my life. I, you know, I'm not troubled by it. I'm going to heaven. Amen. That, that tops everything. Amen, somebody. <laughs> That exalts the believer over every frustrating situation in his life. If you put your trust in Christ, you are going to be with Christ 
in paradise. That's wisdom, isn't it? See, men think that we can put our life together on our own. And by the way, the Bible has a word for that. When you think you can put your life together on your own, the Bible has a word, it calls it pride. Pride. That's what worldly counsel tries to do. It tries to, it tries to avert God, avoid his counsel, avoid his wisdom, because we feel like we can put our life, our life together on our own. I was once, uh, I think it was Micaiah's uh, third or fourth birthday, I was at her mother's house for Christmas, and her dad got her a nice uh, uh, car to play, and, and I was tasked to, uh, I didn't know I was going to put it together. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> And, but I was, I was prideful enough to say, you know what, it's only four pieces. It can't be that hard to put this thing together. I didn't even look at the instructions or something. Put it together. And an hour passed by, and I was still on the floor trying to put this thing together. <laughs> just completely frustrated. And Jaquay's dad came by and said, Billy, did you read the instructions? <laughs> See, that, that, that was my assumption. That it, it can't be that hard. I got good sense. I, 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 can, make, I can make it. I can fix it on my own. Right. Rather than trust in the man who made it. Because he put, he put everything I need to know in the man. Amen, somebody. Yeah. Beloved, God has put everything you need to know about how to live this life. He has put it in the manual. There's no sense you try to strive and make your life live on your own. You need to trust the Lord and put your confidence and trust in him. He will show you how to live this life. He will show you how, how, how to navigate through this world. Amen. Man, look at Ezekiel 16 and 15. I'm going to show you this. Ezekiel 16, 15, it talks about how, how Israel went from the from obscurity to the heights of fame. And then they sank to the abysmal depths of moral evil. And it explains why they declined. You in verse 15? But thou didst trust in thine own beauty and plays the harlot because of thy renown and pours out thy fornication on everyone that passed by. His it was. And of thy garments thou didst take and deck thy high places with, the, with divers colors and place the heart of their, their, their palm. The light thing shall not come neither shall it be so. Thou hast also taken thy fair jewels of my gold and of my silver which I had given thee and made to thyself images of men and didst commit whoredom with them. Now here's the key thing I want you to do. That God is saying here, Everything that God gave them, they pride themselves in those things rather than the God who gave them. Amen. They begin to ascribe their success to those external things. The temple, Jerusalem, rather than the God who gave them the temple, who gave them Jerusalem. What do you ascribe your success? Because you're smart? Amen, somebody. Where you went to school? What is the source of your success? Amen. You better say the Lord. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. See, everything we are, God made us. What we know, God taught us. Where we come, God brought us. Everything that we have, we are by the grace of God, church. See, we can't put our life together on our own. Yeah. Make sure that your life is grounded in the truth of God's word and not in the, in the opinions of men. Don't let anyone ruin you through, through intellectualism or high-sounding nonsense that, 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 that somehow you can make it on your own. Yeah. You can't make it on your own. God, I can't live without you. I can't breathe without you, God. Oh, Lord. Yeah. When I was coming up in the church, we would sing a song, I need thee Every hour, oh Lord, I come. Amen, somebody. Amen. Bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. How many of you guys need the Lord every hour? Amen. If you don't believe that you need the Lord every hour, you are living life in your own power, in your own strength. You are somehow thinking that, that it's your wisdom, it's your ability that's getting you through. And I, 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 it's scary to think about what God will use to help you see otherwise. Amen, Amen somebody. 
God took judgment to, to, to let Israel know, hey, you guys are not making it on your own. You're only making it because of me. You're not surviving because you put a big wall around this city. That wall ain't going ain't, ain't to hold up. Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to knock that wall down. It's not going to stand. Your security can't be in those things. Your security must be in me. We cannot find our security in carnal things. We can find our security in the divine, in the divine son of God. Put your security in him. He will never forsake you. He will never fail you. I'm, I'm done. I have one more thing to say, and I'm done. Let me go back to Ezekiel 13. Not just the judgment on the false prophets, the advice of false prophets turned to foolishness, meaning that it's discredited. I want to say a word about these false women prophets. Oh. Hey, Amen, somebody. Y'all there? Look at verse number 17. Likewise, thou son of man, set thy face against the daughters of thy people, which prophesy out of their own heart. And prophesy thou against them and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe to the women that sew pillows to all armholes and make handkerchiefs upon the head of every stature to hunt souls. Will ye hunt the souls of my people? And will ye save the souls alive that come unto you? And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the souls that should not die and to save the souls alive that should not live by lying to my people that you hear your lies, my people that hear your lies. Wherefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against your pillows, wherewith ye there hunt the souls to make them fly, and I will tear them from your arms, and I will let the souls go, even the souls that ye hunt to make them fly. Now, all of this is about God's judgment upon women. Now, uh, uh, upon women, false women prophets. In Israel, there were both men prophets and women prophets. Amen. There were true men and women prophets, and there were true men and women false prophets. Amen, somebody. And by the way, this is really, it's an interesting point made in 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 5 about the role of women in the church. Amen. Amen. And it needs some clarification. And the Bible says that a woman can prophesy in the church. It does not mean preach in the sense of, the, of, 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 of as, as I'm doing today. Right. I preach the word by preparation. Right. Meaning I go home and study the word of God and ask God what does it mean and come back and convey that meaning to God's people every week. Amen. That's preparation. Yeah, right. In the New Testament times, the beginning of the New Testament church, the start of the church, God was communicating with his people not by preparation in the service but by revelation. Meaning in the, in the end of service, the Spirit of God would bear them up and they would communicate His will for His people through revelation. Now, I don't believe that the revelation, revelational gifts continue. Amen, somebody? Amen. And so, therefore, the idea of a woman standing up and preaching should, should not continue in the church because that gift is not operative today because we have the complete counsel of God in my hand. Amen. The covenant is finished. The word of God is, is complete. Amen, somebody? We don't need any new revelation. All, all revelation has been given. I know how to be saved. I know who saves me. And I know by what power and by what means I'm saved. Oh, Lord. And I know when he's coming back again. Everything that God has given to us is in the word of God. Amen. But there were even in that day women who were prophets, but who were nevertheless who were false prophets who were communicating what was in their own hearts and they were using charms and gadgets, the Bible says, to seduce his people. I want you to know carefully their great crime. Look at verse, if you will, look at verse, uh, verse 20. When you have to say amen. Yeah. I'm sorry, verse, 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 uh, verse 19. And will ye pollute me among my people for handfuls of barley and for pieces of bread to slay the soul that should not die and to save alive the soul that should not live? You see that? Yeah. Through their false lying counsel, the Bible says, they were discouraging the righteous and they were encouraging the wicked. Yeah. In every sermon, the pastor's job is to edify the righteous yeah. and to warn the wicked yeah. and to never treat them both as if we are the same. Yeah. And there's somebody. Yeah. I don't want 
somebody who's a wicked person leaving here with some assurance that their life is okay, they can live in any kind of way and not have to turn from sin and give their life to Christ. But now you don't want a righteous person ever despairing in this world about what they see happening because you understand if you put your trust in Christ, you've been promised glory. You've been promised heaven and you've been promised glory. You've got grace in this life and you've got glory in the future life. A child of God should never leave this place not confident, leave this place with their head hanging down. You should be edified and built up in everlasting life. How do you have to be saved then? Yeah. How do you know in spite of how bad your life may appear yeah. and whatever's going on that there are no real tragedies for the Christian? Yeah. The only tragedy that exists people who don't put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's the real tragedy. The real tragedy in this life is not the one who believes in Christ, who does not enjoy happiness, health, and wealth. The real tragedy in this life is the one who does not know Jesus Christ in this world. The real tragedy may be their happiness, their health, and their wealth. Amen. Because it may, it, 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 it may give them a false security to the forbidding and dreadful future that awaits them. Amen. Put your trust in Christ today. Amen. Amen. Don't listen to false prophets. Hear a faithful man stand up and tell you the word of God. Speak his truth in his name Amen. for his glory. Amen. That's what it's about. Amen. When you go to church, we all talk glorify the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Not about pleasing you. It's about pleasing him. I don't care if y'all fire me. Amen, somebody. Amen. I, I, listen, I, I, I would rather see this church fail Amen. than not be faithful, not be true to what God says. Amen. That's right. Amen. Gracious Lord, our God, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, for just the knowledge of knowing, Lord, that there were false prophets in their day. Help us, Lord, not to read ourselves into that old arrangement, that old covenant. Help us understand, Lord God, that we don't have to fear being cast off from your presence because you sent your beloved son at Calvary. And in your fury, you exiled him from your presence that you may satisfy your righteousness and your justice, that all who put your, their faith and trust in him might be saved. So God, we, we, we don't face an exile as your people. We don't have this fear of being cast off because of what Christ has accomplished at Calvary. We thank you and we give you praise today. Help us to live each day rendering unto you the fruit of gratitude. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.